So yeah, I'm a uh, postdoctoral researcher here at UBC, and um, I'm a botanist, so I study plants. Um, these are a couple of the plants I study, and I'll pass these. I'll pass these around for people to have a look at. Uh, watch the edges of the pot; they're kind of a little bit sharp, but um, if you just hold it from the bottom, you should be okay. Um, but yeah, what I'm gonna I'll get to these plants in a minute. For now, you can just kind of have a look at them. Um, So I'm a botanist, but uh, when I think about the natural world and uh, my inspiration for doing research, I, I think primarily about the uh, evolutionary process of adaptation. Um, and in a really basic sense, all biologists are studying adaptation. We're attempting to use the uh, different tools of biological research to understand how small changes um, driven by natural selection have led to the uh, incredible diversity of organisms that we see today all over the earth. And my particular fascination is, of course, plants. But this applies um, to all of life. And the tools that I use to study plants are the same tools that people use to study any of the uh, wonderful and any of the wonderful organisms that you see here um, on the board. Everything from elephants to frogs, uh, desert plants, insects. And so I just want you guys to keep that in mind today as I, as I go through these slides and talk about um, my particular interest, which is the interaction between plants and soils. So I, I do most of my research in Western North America, um, not so much here in British Columbia, but farther south in California and Oregon. And there, um, when you're out and about driving around looking at plants, looking at plant habitats, you come across examples like this pretty frequently. What we have here is two very different plant communities. In the foreground, we have um, this very dense, hard, what we call chaparral. It's this shrubland plant community. And in the background, we have this more open understory uh, oak woodland. And the, the boundary between these two plant communities um, is not induced by man or fire or any of those kinds of processes that might immediately come to mind. It's driven by soil. Um, what we have right here is a geological fault line between a very, very poor soil in the foreground, not a lot of nutrients, um, not a lot of the yummy stuff that plants need to survive. And in the background, a much richer soil that provides the plants everything that they need to kind of to make it in a harsh environment. Um, one of the classic soils that does this is this, is this um, soil called serpentine. And it's derived from these rocks that are very easy to recognize because they're green. And these, these soils are very, like I was saying before, very poor in the nutrients that the plants need. Um, they're often very dry. They're tough environments for plants. And so the plants need to have very specialized adaptations to survive under these conditions. And one of the things that's particularly tough about these soils is that they contain a lot of heavy metals. Um, serpentine in particular is loaded with nickel, cadmium, chromium, cobalt, in some cases mercury and lead. Um, and these are as, as most people know, these are elements that even animals like us can't really tolerate that well. And plants have different relationships with them, but at the same time, they, they need to adapt. And there's examples of these all over the world. This is a um, what we call a laterite on the island of New Caledonia near Australia. Uh, these very characteristically red soils are um, derived from serpentine. These are very old soils, uh, many millions of years old, but they're Basically, they're red because they're full of iron, but they're also full of other um, metals that, that oxidize to unusual colors, like nickel and chromium. So this is, this is something that happens all over the world. And plants have responded to it in a sort of concerted way. Um, if you look at it in terms of this sort of circle diagram here, we have all plants um, in the world, all third of a, a, third of a billion, of, or a third of a million of them, 300,000 plant species. Um, and some of them are tolerant of metals. They grow on these soils I was just telling you about, these laterites and these serpentines. And they're able to tolerate high levels of metal. And they've become adapted to this um, basically by you know, initially colonizing the soil. Maybe a, maybe a plant had an adaptation that allowed it to live on that soil um, that already existed. And so it got onto the soil. And as evolutionary time went by, it became more and more resistant to that, to that high level of nickel or that high level of, of um, iron. And then the next, the next stage in this process is what we call metal accumulation. 
And so these are plants that are both tolerant of metals, but also store metals. These are the metal munchers that I'm referring to in my title. Uh, these plants basically grow on soils that are high in, that are high in metals, and they, uh, they suck them up through their roots, and they store them in their leaves, and their stems, and their flowers. And we don't, we don't really know why they do this. Um, that's one of the things I'm trying to figure out as a researcher. A couple of the theories that are out there are um, probably the first one that you guys thought of, which is defense. Here is a, uh, a bug on a flower of a nickel hyperaccumulator. This bug is actually highly tolerant of nickel. Um, it evolved, it adapted to um, be able to eat these nickel-rich plants, and it, it, has higher, it has levels of nickel in its hemolymph that are three orders of magnitude higher than a human could tolerate. So many thousands of times more nickel this plant, this insect can tolerate than we can. Um, and so, but of course, most insects can't do that. Uh, most insects eat a nickel hyperaccumulating plant or a cadmium hyperaccumulating plant or selenium, arsenic, thallium, and they just immediately die. So these plants are highly defended by the metals that they uptake. Um, other ideas include drought resistance. Um, some of these plants store huge amounts of these metals just in, their, in the, um, the sort of what we call the cell wall that's outside of the cytoplasm, so it's not physiologically active. And if they get drought stress, they can release all of that metal into the, cyto into the, um, the apoplast outside the, outside the cell membrane. And it allows the cell to resist, dry to resist drying. Um, and that's a, an effective um, osmoregulation. But in any case, uh, hyperaccumulators can take up, or there are hyperaccumulators that take up a whole variety of, of metals. And here's some of their, some of their formulas here. Things like I was talking about before, cadmium, copper, arsenic, gold, zinc, lead, lead again, thallium, nickel, cobalt, chromium. These are really, really pretty burly, tough metals for, um, for most organisms to, to tolerate. But we know of examples of plants that uptake all of these. And remarkably, there's actually some plants that will uptake most of these. Um, there's three or four examples of plants out there that can, that can uptake um, eight or nine of these elements all at the same time. So we're just, we're just now starting to understand this in terms of evolution. But when you think about, um, you think about these different elements, uh, these are just, just to give you some examples of what these things actually look like. You've got your, some cobalt here, chromium, um, copper, and gold. These are just a few examples of, of elements that, that we know that plants are capable of accumulating. Um, and just to go through some examples to kind of give this some, some reality for you guys, those two plants that I passed around are ones that I study. That's um, Streptanthus polygoloides from California. And it's able to uh, uptake nickel to about 2% of its, of its dry weight. Um, if you think about 2% uh, doesn't sound like very much, but if you think about our bodies, uh, our bodies contain about 1 ppm, part per million of, of nickel. So 2% of nickel is basically about 40,000 times that. So these are huge amounts of metals compared to what normal organisms can tolerate. Um, another example besides nickel, um, we have here a fern, which I put in for one of my friends who's here who studies ferns. Um, this is Terrace, and it accumulates uh, arsenic. These plants were discovered growing in um, what are called cattle dips. If you've ever traveled in cattle country, um, what they'll often do is make a pond and they'll fill the pond with arsenic-laced water, and then they'll drive the cattle through the pond. And the arsenic is supposed to kill all of the pests that are in the coat of the cattle. Um, it's a practice that's kind of gone by the wayside because they were contaminating the soil and causing all kinds of environmental problems. But arsenic sticks around. Once you've dumped arsenic in the soil, it doesn't go anywhere. It stays there. And so these arsenic ponds, these cattle dips, have become basically um, uh, hazardous waste sites. Like you can't really, you can't allow animals or, or um, people to get in there because they could be arsenic poisoned. But one of the things they noticed was that this fern was growing in there. Nothing else was growing in there, just this fern. And when they looked at its tissues, it turned out that it was not only tolerating arsenic, but accumulating it to huge levels. Um, another example that some people might have heard of are these plants from the American Southwest. This is a, a mustard here that accumulates selenium. And these plants have actually become a huge problem in the Southwest because this is an area where um, cattle grazing and sheep grazing are very important economic activities. And as you can imagine, a sheep comes along and eats the selenium-laced plant and is pretty much done for. 
these these plants contain sufficient amounts of selenium to you know to kill most organisms in one you know one one meal of the of one of these plants would be enough to kill a sheep. Um, and it, but at the same time, even when the sheep aren't there or aren't grazing on it directly, what this plant is doing is tr is it concentrating um, selenium out of the soil. So if you were to pick up a handful of dirt from where, where this plant is growing and eat it, you'd be fine. I mean, selenium is in everything. It's in our water. It's in the dust that you breathe in in your house. But what this plant is doing is preferentially extracting selenium from the soil, like a miner extracting metal from the dirt, from the earth. And so when this plant decomposes, it creates a selenium hazard. This plant, if it's 2% or 3% selenium, it dies, it rots, and the surface soil layer will be about 1% selenium. And this builds up over time, and the other plants take up the selenium. Most plants can take up certain levels of, of heavy metals, not huge levels like this plant could, but enough to make them potentially dangerous. And over time, um, huge acreages, uh, a very large proportion of the desert southwest has become contaminated with selenium because of these plants. And there's a couple actually invasive species that do this, um, introduced species from Europe that are a real problem. And people are trying to control those noxious weeds in order to prevent cattle poisoning and other kinds of contamination. Uh, another amazing example of, um, in this case, nickel hyperaccumulation is this plant from New Caledonia, again, that island I was talking about before off of the coast of Australia. This is a, a stem tip of this plant, Cybertia cuminata. It's in the same family that rubber is in, and so it produces this milky, sticky latex. So if you tear off a couple of leaves like they've done in this picture, this milky ooze starts to come out of the plant stem. And in a normal member of this plant family, this stuff would be white. It would be a very bright white color. But this plant has so much nickel in its sap that it actually turns the color of nickel sulfate when it, when it contacts the air. This sap is 25% nickel by dry weight. If you were to collect a liter of this sap, that would be about a, about a thousand grams of sap. 250 grams of that would be nickel. That's the weight of two major league hard balls if you play baseball. So a kilo or a, a liter of, of that sap, about twice this, would be the weight of, you would have two baseball weights worth of nickel in it. Um, and this was, when people discovered this plant, this was an, a paper in the journal Nature, the most significant journal in science. Um, and people were just totally captivated by this. Here's a, here's a chop with a hatchet into the trunk of the same plant with this very ominous looking glowing blue color. And I'll, uh, I'll pass around this vial of, um, this is nickel sulfate. This is the um, compound that I use to treat my, the plants that I study when I'm trying to induce them to accumulate nickel. And you'll notice a similarity in the color. And that's, that's exactly why the sap is blue, because it's 25% nickel. Um, but these plants, this is just one extreme example of a kind of plant that's very common in a place like New Caledonia or Cuba. This is the southern, the very southernmost tip of New Caledonia. Uh, and this was the area where a lot of the nickel hyperaccumulators were first discovered. When people found this plant, Cybertia, and a couple of its close relatives, they, start, they started thinking, well, we're finding this in all these diverse groups of plants. Let's go out and start prospecting for these plants. And so they went into plant habitats like this and just collected every plant they could see and tested them all for nickel. And it turned out that hundreds of them were hyperaccumulating nickel. There's over 150 species of nickel hyperaccumulating plants in New Caledonia, half the total number known in the world. Another hundred of them are found in Cuba. Uh, unfortunately, I'm an American, so I can't go to Cuba and see them. But you guys could all go there and see these plants. If you have the opportunity, I highly recommend it. New Caledonia, too, just an amazing place. Um, down here, it, what you see in the background here, these buildings, this is the world's largest uh, nickel mine. So the plants and the people are after the nickel in New Caledonia. So when we think about, um, so I've talked a little bit about some of these plants that, that, um, that munch metals, that take metals out of the soil and accumulate them in their tissues. When we think about this, one of the first things that comes to mind maybe as a, as a non-scientist or a or a person who's got an interest in science but isn't a basic researcher like me. I just study this because I want to know why do they accumulate. I don't care whether we can actually do anything with it. But of course, what most people would think of is how will this help people? Um, and obviously, it could help us a lot. Um, 
So those four elements that I just showed you there that are all known to be hyperaccumulated plants are incredibly important um, commodities and, and in some cases precious metals. Here we have a chromium, a chromium um, coated uh, drill bit, very important in industry. It allows you to harden the, um, to harden the steel to make it better at cutting. This of course is a chrome plated propeller on a, on a boat. Anybody who has um, fancy, fancy rims on their, on their car or fancy trim on their car would be chrome plated. Um, this is a, a, copper, a copper electrical cable. Uh, copper is incredibly important. It's basically what transports all of our electricity. It's what transport. It's, it's what's used in most in most non um, semiconductor type computer technology. You know, inside your computer, inside your phone, inside your cell phone, everything has copper in it. It's a very very important element. Um, and of course, gold. Uh, gold being what we use in our reserve banks to stabilize our economies, and also in our computer chips. It's a uh, a, not, a metal that does not corrode. And so it's very, it's very valuable for micro components and things like that. So these are all things that we use. Um, but unfortunately, in order to get these elements, we have to do some incredibly destructive things to the earth. Uh, this here is a uh, copper mine in Utah that has experienced one of the largest man-induced landslides in all of history. An entire third or so of the side of the super pit mine collapsed almost taking with it the, uh, the head offices of the mine. You can see here they escaped by probably a matter of meters. And what's interesting is it appears that they're actually still there. These look like parked vehicles to me, so they don't seem that concerned about it. But in any case, these enormous super pit mines, in some cases um, several kilometers deep, I visited the largest pit mine in the world, the, uh, the super pit in Kalgoorlie, Australia. It's over two kilometers deep. So when you're standing on the rim of it, you look down, and these these loaders that drive up these these ramp roads to the to the surface, you know, these loaders that can carry a hundred tons of, of dirt in the back of them, or just these specks at the bottom of the pit, it takes something like an hour and a half for a loader to drive from the bottom of the pit to the rim. Another amazing example: this is the highest elevation mine in the world. This is in West Papua New Guinea, um, which is now part of Indonesia. The rim of this mine is at 4,000 meters elevation. It's over here, just to the left, there's actually a glacier, which is one of the world's four equatorial glaciers. This is an incredibly high, incredibly extreme environment. Here's the road leading up to the mine that allows the mine workers who live down here at 2,000 meters elevation, where humans can actually survive in the long term, have to drive up this road every day to 4,000 meters elevation, enter the pit. Over here, there's a tramway leading from the from the, t the head of the pit where they bring the materials to, to the, um, the, slurry, the slurry works, which I think is here and here, or maybe the tram runs here to the slurry works. It's the world's largest free, world's highest free span tram. It was specially built by a Swiss firm. Um, it descends over 2,000 meters in elevation, so it's something like three times the height and the span of the tram that you would ride up to, um, to Grouse Mountain. And it was built to carry the to carry the ore, the rock, from the top here, 4,000 meters, down to an elevation where they could actually make the slurry. And from there, it's piped over 100 kilometers through the largest mangrove swamp in the world to the coast, where it's offloaded onto ships and taken to the US, China, and um, a bunch of other countries where copper is a very important um, element. It also happens to be the world's largest gold mine. Um, for every kilogram of copper they take out of here, they take out something like an ounce of gold. And so it's incredibly profitable. But I was telling one of my friends uh, um, yesterday, actually, this mine has destabilized the politics of an entire country or an entire province of, of Indonesia. This mine needs to survive. This is most of the world's copper. Almost all of the copper being, manuf being mined today comes out of this pit for the whole world. Um, there's copper mines everywhere, but in terms of lots and lots of copper, this is where it's coming from. So this thing needs to keep going for, our econ for the world economy to continue going. The copper needs to keep coming out of this pit. But it's caused a lot of political problems in, in New Guinea because um, people who are trying to advocate for um, political reform often get sort of, um, they get harassed by uh, by mine workers. They they run into problems with the government, who doesn't who wants stability in order for these mines to continue functioning, and so normal political processes can't really go forward in this kind of environment. 
I mean, I'm a scientist, so this probably really isn't my field. But when I look at these, these examples of environmental degradation and political destabilization, I think, how could what I study you know, possibly help this? How could we avoid turning this pristine alpine environment into a slag heap? Um, and examples, of course, also in New Caledonia. This is the, that nickel mine I was showing you before, the world's largest nickel mine. Um, they're set to put in a coal-powered, a coal-fired power plant here that's going to increase the per capita production of CO2 in New Caledonia to levels that are, that are only presently known in the European Union. So they're going to, I think, multiply by ten, a factor of 10 the amount of CO2 being output per capita in New Caledonia because they're going to be burning coal in order to smelt this nickel. So that's an environmental concern if you're thinking about in terms of CO2 and the climate change. And so I'm a scientist, and so I think, what can I do as a botanist, you know? What can I do to help this situation? How could I help stabilize the world's um, politics, um, help the environment, reduce CO2 output, reduce the amount of pollution that we put into the groundwater? Bless you. Um, and so, of course, scientists kind of get this rap as being a little bit crazy, and I think it's for good reason. We, uh, we tend to think about things in terms of what we can do, and, and um, really the sky's the limit. We don't, we don't stop to uh, think about rational things or, and th think about practical things. We're, uh, we're all about the base, the way that things work, and we want to figure that out. We also want to help people, though. So in terms of uh, how hyperaccumulation could help solve these problems I was talking about, um, here's that same diagram before. But you imagine if we could grow this plant uh, in the presence of these um, elements, we could actually grow metals as a crop instead of mining them from the earth the way that we do now, taking the dirt itself and extracting the metals from them. We could use the power of photosynthesis to extract these elements from the soil. And, um, and really, it's a pretty simple process. Harvest the plant, burn it, and you've got the metal. Um, this is just a kind of flow chart of how what we call a phyto-mining would actually work. I, I like to think of it more as um, more as agricultural mining, um, because it's more that you're using the you're using the power of plants to extract, you know, to grow the nickel or the the thallium or the gold as a crop, rather than actually an actual mining technique. You know, we would grow nickel the way we grow uh, soybeans for for protein. So you grow your plant on a metal a metal containing soil, whatever you like, nickel, thallium, gold, everything. Um, in some cases, you can add complexing agents, things like citric acid or EDTA. These basically um, kind of plow through the soil, um, grabbing onto the nickel or th to the metal ions and allowing the plants to take them up more easily. But you wouldn't necessarily need to do that because most, there's a lot of plants out there, like the ones I study, that do this naturally. They scavenge nickel from the soil. They scavenge cadmium from the soil. They do it very effectively. From there, you could burn the plant material in the process, co-generating carbon neutral electricity instead of burning coal the way they do now. Um, or, you could, or you could ferment it and make um, biofuel, biodiesel, biofuels. And from there you have this pile of ash. If anybody's burned uh, logs in their fireplace, you know that you get an accumulation of ash. What that ash is, is all of these unburnable elements that are in the, the logs or the plant material or whatever. In the case of our hyperaccumulators, it wouldn't just be things like phosphorus and sulfur. There would be a proportion of gold and nickel or whatever we wanted to hyperaccumulate in there. And from there, you could smelt it to an ore. Um, one, I'll just go through one example of this, a practical example for nickel. This is actually the plant that I passed around, um, uh, Streptanthus polygoloides, which is now sitting on the, the counter back there. This is being grown in a field in El Dorado County, California. It's being deliberately grown by a person who worked for the, um, the, for the uh, I think, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And they were just interested in, you know, could we actually do this? Could we grow a nickel hyperaccumulating plant on nickel-rich soil and harvest the nickel? The answer, of course, is yes. Um, they, they grew about a half an acre of this stuff, um, harvested the whole thing, you know, just like you're harvesting some wheat burned it into ash, and then basically made an ash slurry and loaded it into a uh, 
basically a, what, I, what I use for my research, a gel rig, an electrophoresis device. And so you run a current through the liquid and the, uh, the, nickel, the nickel ions being charged um, two plus are attracted to the negative, the negative terminal of the, uh, of the apparatus and lumps of pure nickel accumulate. And so these, unfortunately there's not a scale here. Apparently this one's about the size of the end of your thumb and this one may be a pinky fingernail sized. And so they're able to smelt pure nickel out of these, out of these plants using very, very low impact um, kinds of processes. You know, this was just some nickel rich soil that had already been destroyed by grazing. They seeded the plant into it. They harvested it the same way you might harvest some wheat and just ashed it in a furnace. So in terms of uh, bringing, this, bringing this to actual, uh, to my actual research, making me the, uh, the, crazy, the crazy scientist here, uh, I study two hyperaccumulators. In this, and in the case of my plants, it's nickel. Um, the one that I passed around is Streptanthus polygoloides. Um, this one here is Streptanthus insignis, a close relative that we're comparing to it. Um, it grows on the serpentine soils, mostly in California. Um, and the other one that I'm studying is this, this plant, Stachousia, from Australia. I spent the first half of my postdoc in Australia researching this guy. Um, and it grows in quite different habitats. In this case, these, uh, these pretty dry subtropical savannas. This is a eucalyptus tree, a classic Australian tree. Um, and what I've done, I'm trying to compare these two very distantly related genera because they both contain a single nickel hyperaccumulator. And the question is, how has nickel hyperaccumulation evolved sort of from nothing in these two separate groups of plants? They're very isolated cases of nickel hyperaccumulation. There aren't any close relatives of these plants that are known to hyperaccumulate. And so we're interested in understanding how did the adaptation pop up out of nowhere, out of a group of plants that doesn't even really tolerate nickel? How did this amazing trait of hyperaccumulating nickel to one or two percent of its dry weight just come out of nothing? And so we've taken these two groups so that we can ha kind of have a comparative context. If we can show that the evolutionary process was similar in these two groups, then we might be able to expand that to all of the nickel hyperaccumulators in the world, uh, many of which are very distantly related. Um, here, I'm here I'm digesting some soil using hydrofluoric acid, um, probably the most dangerous lab technique I've ever used. You can see this incredible getup that I'm in. If you come up and visit me in my lab upstairs, this is not what normal scientists actually look like when we're in the lab. We're very frequently in flip-flops <laughs> running around. <laughs> Uh, but this is actually quite dangerous, this hydrofluoric acid, which I'm pouring right here. Um, about 10 years ago, a guy working in this exact lab accidentally dumped 100 mils of this in his lap. Uh, it immediately ate through his apron, his jeans, contacted his skin, went into his bloodstream, and proceeded to digest his bones and all of his internal organs. And he died two days later, uh, floating in a swimming pool. Uh, this is an incredibly dangerous uh, um, acid. Basically, what hydrofluoric acid does is... Uh, it releases these very, very chemically active fluorine atoms, and they, they, can, they digest everything that's not organic, which is actually dangerous because it digests things that most, that, that are very, very normally very resistant in our bodies, things like our bones. Um, and we use it to digest rock because it, what it can actually do is digest the silica minerals themselves. So you can't actually, you have to use plastic beakers for this stuff because it eats glass. Anyway, it's just something I thought you guys might be interested in because it's pretty extreme science going on right there. And so Catherine, this is my assistant Catherine, she was with me the whole time uh, making sure that if I dumped hydrofluoric acid in myself, I didn't just go home and have a beer like that other grad student did and it cost him his life. Um, here's Catherine looking at some seeds that we're growing on a petri dish. We uh, collected seeds for uh, about 40 species of Stachousia and we grew them on different on agar, this, um, this, base, this growth medium in, a, in petri dishes to see how resistant the different species were to nickel. And this is, this is the uh, streptanthus growing here actually in the UBC greenhouse. I'm growing these, I'm growing these under controlled conditions and um, treating them with nickel, taking a group of, you know, say about 100 seedlings of the nickel hyperaccumulator, treating half of them with nickel and the other half not. And I'm trying to look at the transcriptome of these, of these plants under, under those conditions. And basically what a transcriptome is, is uh, 
it's the the DNA, it's how the plant communicates you know from its genome from its DNA to its actual functions so it transcribes a gene the gene uh, is coded into protein and the protein goes and does cell functions and so our question is if we treat half the plants with nickel and half without can we look at the different genes that are being produced or being activated under this treatment and find a difference that's associated with nickel hyperaccumulation and this is just how we go prospecting for potential genes that might be involved so we might, we're hoping that what we'll be able to do is identify a couple of genes, or maybe even just one gene, that is actually um, doing this hyperaccumulation activity. And one of the process, one of the machines we use to do that is this uh, genome sequencer. Um, over the last five or ten years, the process of actually sequencing entire genomes has become uh, pretty commonplace. We have one of the, those, these machines right here in the building. It's able to sequence, um, in a single run, 30 billion base pairs of DNA. So the human genome is about 3 billion base pairs. So in one day, this thing can sequence 10 human genomes. So this has opened up a lot of possibilities for people like me. I can take DNA from these different, or um, RNA in my case, from these different organisms, run them on this sequencer, and it's a huge amount of data. But out of that data, you're able to extract some very interesting results in terms of how plants evolve, um, how they adapt at a micro scale, and how they do things like store nickel. Um, and eventually what we're hoping is that if we could identify a gene that confers nickel hyperaccumulation, um, and this might be potentially controversial, but as a scientist I think of this as a real possibility, um, is potentially cloning these genes into other organisms. We could create uh, genetically modified organisms that are able to accumulate the metal, specific metals that we want. We could gene tailor organisms to be better miners of metals and to allow us to have a smaller footprint on the environment. We wouldn't have to build these giant mines at 4,000 meters elevation in pristine rainforest of West Papua. We wouldn't have to destabilize the, the uh, politics of foreign countries. It would reduce our reliance on these kind of things in the same way that developing our own oil fields reduces our reliance on foreign oil. And so I, that's how, that's sort of the arc of my research. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm just trying to figure out how do plants evolve, how do they adapt, and how have amazing things like nickel hyperaccumulation developed in the course of diversification. And with that, I'll thank everybody who's helped me out. Um, my, my advisor here at UBC, Lauren Reesberg, and his lab. Uh, my collaborators in California, Sharon Strauss and her postdoc, Eva Liu. Um, Ryan O'Dell, who works for the Bureau of Land Management, um, and the U.S. National Science Foundation, and um, the National Geographic Society have provided the, the necessary money. Uh, and with that, I will take questions, I guess. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? I have a question about the uh, arsenic burn that yeah. you were talking about earlier in the show. Yeah. So I was wondering, did that, did that burn just uh, start sucking up arsenic after it became arsenic pond, or like it, it could always do that before? As far as we can tell, they've, they've always been able to do that. It's, um, it's what we call a, a, a facultative accumulator. So it grows on soils that don't have any arsenic in them at all. It's quite a widespread fern, actually. It's all over the world. Um, but it, it, it just had this trait to begin with, as far as we can tell. And it's turned out to actually, it's been found in several other ferns, so it seems to be something that ferns have a capacity for. Um, not all ferns can do it, but there's definitely a few fern lineages. So yeah, it just, it just came, it's what we call a pre-adaptation. Most accumulators of nickel, though, um, are what we call an obligate accumulator. They only grow on nickel-rich soils. And, and presumably it's because they evolved that trait as they colonized the soil. But yeah, the, the ferns can grow pretty much anywhere. But yeah, they're, a lot of these nickel hyperaccumulators, when you go to the environments where they're found, they're the only thing growing there, because they're the only thing capable of tolerating such high levels of the, of the metals. Yeah, good question. Yeah, go ahead. Do asparagus ferns do that? Because I have an asparagus for nickel. Oh, yeah. If I put arsenic in its soil, would it die or would it destroy? I don't know. You, you might do an experiment. Do you have some arsenic? No. <laughs> <laughs> look, maybe I could look for it. 
Yeah, yeah. You could you could probably find some. You wouldn't want to eat it. Um, I think rat poison is actually arsenic. If you could get your get your hands on some rat poison. But what what if it has other stuff in it? Uh, in the in what the the soil in the, or in the rat poison, and then it would mm. kill it. Anyway. And that would kill the plant. Yeah, you'd want and my pure. My dog would probably. Eat <laughs> That's true. You want to keep your dog from eating these. Um, my, the plant that I study, the nickel hyperaccumulator that's up there on the, on the podium, um, they, they say that if a cow were to come along and eat, um, I think 15 or I think a dozen or so adults of that plant, it would be a lethal dose of nickel. And arsenic, of course, is even more toxic, so you, would, you want to keep your pets away. But it wouldn't kill you if you just touched it, right? No, it wouldn't. No, you'd have to eat it and chew it up and digest it, yeah. But my dog eat, ate tar and it survived. <laughs> Sounds like a tough dog. <laughs> you should try metal hyperaccumulating dogs. That's an experiment. Yeah, most of these plants actually aren't dangerous. They're not, so don't, you don't want to think of these plants themselves as being something that when you touch them, you're, you guys don't need to go home and wash your hands or anything. And that's actually part of the appeal of mining with these plants, is that individual plants wouldn't be toxic. Um, and so it would allow you to, to deal with the materials in the mining process in a you know, less environmentally destructive way. Whereas a lot of metal, metal ores you know, are often uh, have such high levels of metals in them that even after we have extracted the metals we want, they're still toxic. So, yeah. Any other questions? Do you have any examples of, uh, I guess, more more native plants that would be great for items like phyto remediation, so tailing ponds and stuff yeah. like that? Yeah, there's actually native examples of these. Um, if, if you in North America, so you mean in terms of remediating like a mine, mine spoil and mine, mine yeah. The uh, the one back there, it's Streptanthus polygoloides, would be excellent for um, any mine, that was, any nickel mine that was on serpentine. I, I worked with a a botanist with the Bureau of Land Management in California who was trying to remediate um, these cinnabar mines in California. They, to, to extract gold, they, you have to use a lot of mercury, at least the, the old school way of doing it. You basically dump mercury on there. The mercury scavenges the gold, and then you literally burn the mercury. So you're releasing mercury into the atmosphere. You're dumping mercury onto the soil. It's this incredibly environmentally destructive process. But of course, when they mined the mercury, they caused a mess too. And they're just trying to get anything to grow on these mercury pits. Yeah. You go there, and it's these mercury mines were put in in the 1860s, and they're still just bare dirt. There isn't even like algae growing on it. But these plants can grow there. So um, I'm not sure about here in British Columbia. We have there's actually serpentine soils here, and I think there might have been some mines as well. Some of the gold that's here is probably associated with serpentine. Um, a lot of plants can actually tolerate. Uh, these metals pretty well. So if you're just if you're just trying to get some vegetation onto the mine site, um, and, and so that it's not washing away and going into water supplies and watersheds, um, it's it's often pretty easy to find plants that can do that. Grasses are a good way to, place to start. Most grasses are pretty tolerant of uh, of these really difficult soils. Um, kind of more drought resistant types of plants, um, like seeing you guys have seen out this here would be my gut would be a good one. Um, Mostly you want to look for plants that are naturally kind of resistant to really crummy soils. You know, things that would normally grow on a dry, um, exposed slope or would grow like in a, you know, in a river bed or something like that. Plants that can tolerate disturbance and drought and things like that, they're usually pretty well adapted to survive these, you know, these tough metal conditions. But I'm not a, enough of a British Columbia botanist to, to think of specific, any specific plants from here. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Any other questions? Those are all good questions. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Do you know of any examples where people are actually extracting? Like you showed the, the plant with the nickel, you was related to rubber. Are people actually extracting? I think they'd like to. I mean, it's a, it's really a compelling. It's a compelling idea um, that you could basically milk these things the way that we do rubber trees for to make tires you know even even today uh, you if you if you get passed on the road by an 18 wheeler truck all the tires on that truck are made with up to i think 40 to 70 percent natural rubber we still haven't found a substitute for it and so it's not it's not an inconceivable idea that we could plant groves of these trees and have rubber tappers out there tapping for nickel 
I think one of the main reasons it's not actually happening is because um, mining is such an established industry. Uh, we, we have a lot of good technology for mining. We know how to do it. There's entire industries that have been built up around the process of mining itself. The people who build the machines that, that move the earth, the people who produce the chemicals that we pour on the, onto the, um, the ore to extract the metals. So it's, I think that, that's been difficult because basically it's like, it would be like a farmer walking into a mine and being like, hey guys, I think I can grow this corn, you know, and we could have some nickel in it, you know, and they'd just be like, what are you talking about? You know, they're from, a, they're from such a completely different background. I think that getting, basically taking a botanist and getting them to talk, you know, to be able to make sense to a miner is something that's going to take a long time. Um, I think we might eventually get there, but we do need to think about other ethical concerns, you know, are, are we willing to turn over even more land to agriculture than we already have, you know, and it could be potentially destructive to the environment to, to basically be plowing up areas of these nickel soils or these thallium soils or these gold soils. Um, but on the other hand, we have these slag heaps everywhere, and they're, they're proliferating as, as our thirst for commodities and metals uh, increases. So just taking those mine tailings and growing these plants on them can be a really, a really easy way to do it. And the remarkable thing is that these things can extract huge amounts of nickel from very, very small amounts of, uh, of actual nickel in the soil, like the nickel sulfate I was passing around. That, that vial, you know, that would be enough for me to treat my entire experiment. And each of the plants in the experiment is accumulating about 1% nickel by dry weight. So they're, they're basically extracting all of it. So you wouldn't need, the soil doesn't need to be very rich in these metals, um, especially for things like gold and um, selenium. The plants are incredibly good at scavenging this stuff. Um, they're not just taking the, the few ions that they contact, they're actually releasing chelating agents into the soil and taking those chelating agents back up. So they, they really are mining, and they're better at it than we are, which is a, an amazing idea. Yeah. Anybody else? Now, if this type of an idea was too much production, would, would it ever deplete the soil of, I guess, the, the metals? And would you, have to, yeah. <laughs> would you have to introduce the metals again? I mean, at your example of having the, the yeah. trans ponds uh, right close by, I yeah. think those year after year would be great, because that's always, you know, you're also having more material product. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there'd be any danger of that, honestly. Um, a lot of the nickel that's in the soil is actually locked up in the minerals. That's why I did those hydrofluoric acid digests. I was trying to compare the amount of nickel that's what we call bioavailable. It's actually already broken down into its into ions in the soil. And so the plant, the chelating agent, can basically grab onto that ion and bring it into the plant. But a lot of the nickel is actually locked up in microparticles of the soil itself. And, and that takes a long time to weather. And so as you know, as time goes on, those microparticles are weathering and breaking down into the ions. And so it's not, it doesn't seem to be the case. And they're not very mobile either. Um, almost all of these elements are things that will stick around in the soil, especially nickel. Um, that's part of the reason why it's such a big problem. Things like arsenic and nickel for contamination. Most other dangerous elements just, you know, percolate through the soil. But these things get complex with organic matter and they're, there. they're pretty much there for good. And they're, they're there at levels that are even extremely, even levels that we wouldn't even consider contamination were our levels that these, that, that these plants could hyperaccumulate off of. It's, a pretty, it's pretty remarkable. Like I, I treat my plants with, I think, um, 0.5 or 0.1, not even 1 ppm of nickel. And they're able to hyperaccumulate to 1% of their dry weight. You know, I think nickel, nickel ore has to be something like 2% to be economically viable. So you, that could, you could go for, my sense is that you could go for decades and decades off of that. There's just so much nickel in the rock, and our mining processes are so inefficient. You know, in order to be cheap enough to make these um, fairly low-value metals profitable. Um, but the plants could do it better, I think. We just need to get it into process. Yeah, any other questions? Right, well, thanks, everybody. That was a lot of, a lot of excellent questions.